testing one two one two one two. Can you hear me? Oh, I can't hear me coming off of here. I can't hear this mic. Hello world. Hello, hello. Test one, two, one, two. I'm not getting any sound on these speakers here. Yes? How's yours? Actually, is this coming through the microphones? Hello? I don't think so. I don't think it's coming through the speakers either. On? Yeah, it should be on. They just turned it on. The little green thing. Make sure you got a green light on. Green light? So it's not coming through the speakers? Hello? Testing. 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 Good. This row, stand up, then this row, then this row. We're going to have a little fun today to keep you awake after lunch. <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry for any technical difficulties, but the uh, microphone seems to be working fairly well. Maybe. Anyway, um, hope you all enjoyed lunch. And uh, kick back, be comfortable. We'll uh, try to uh, keep you awake here this afternoon. Uh, I want to introduce all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. Tom Aiken, he's with the Southeast Cyber Crime Institute at uh, Kennesaw University. And should be some interesting things about router for uh, Cisco forensics. So a uh, warm welcome for Tom. Welcome. All right, can everybody hear me? This is yes, this is no. OK, no? Can you turn this up? I can just talk louder. Talk for a bit and let me adjust this way. Talk for a bit. All right. Tell a few jokes. <laughs> Is that better? Yes? Yeah, Excellent. Good. There we go. Don't turn it up too loud. No. <laughs> go ahead. I'll, All right. I'll be on. My name is Thomas Aiken. I'm director of the Southeast Cybercrime Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. It's part of Kennesaw State University, and it's a partnership between the university, the FBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Georgia Technology Authority, National White Collar Crime Center, and a few other people. And um, we provide education and training in the areas of cybercrime, help corporations, you know, show them how to protect themselves and also how to investigate incidents. And we also do, tra you know, training for law enforcement only, hoping to, you know, get them up to speed in, you know, computer-related crimes. Um, also a member of the Georgia Cybercrime Task Force. Um, where I work with them, work with the GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, on um, a regular basis and occasionally with the FBI when they need a, some analysis done. So enough about that. We're going to talk about Cisco Router Forensics today and we're going to start off kind of with a brief overview of, you know, Cisco vulnerabilities, um, what happens when a Cisco router is hacked. We'll go through some of the important things very briefly like chain of evidence and, you know, have a, a sample form. Those of you who've been doing forensics, you know, you can sleep during that part because it is after lunch. Just don't snore or I'll throw something at you. And, whoa. And then we'll, then we'll actually start talking about um, performing forensics on Cisco routers themselves and how exactly it's very different from the traditional forensics process. So we'll go ahead and get started. Just a brief overview of Cisco bug track vulnerabilities. Um, 1998, there were three. 1999, five. 2023, 2001, 46. Between January and July, we've had 47 Cisco vulnerabilities listed. Um, and so I just basically doubled that number for the rest of the year if it keeps up. And a chart showing just like everybody else in all general incidents and vulnerabilities, it's growing exponentially. Some of the example exploits, one of the you know, most detrimental ones was the HTTP authentication 
um, vulnerability. Um, basically, Cisco routers have 16 different um, privilege levels. And so if you chose any number above one of those 16 privilege levels, you got you know, super user access, enable access on the router um, across the web. And so a lot of people really enjoyed that for a while, rerouting people's packets, crashing routers, doing some really thing, things like that. Um, there was an NTP vulnerability. Um, basically, using an NTP control packet, you were able to you know, hit a buffer overflow and crash the router. SNMP parsing vulnerability, everybody heard about the SNMP issue that affected pretty much everybody with that issue. And so um, I, I did not attend a presentation, I believe, yesterday on you know, a, re a new buffer overflow for Cisco routers. Did anybody attend that? Did they actually have shell code for, they had shell code for an iOS um, overflow? That's the first shell code I've seen for an iOS, you know, buffer overflow um, because, you know, the code is not supposed to be published, but it's out there if you know where to get it. And, it, you know, someone's finally taking the time to write um, an iOS, you know, shell code vulnerability. When a router's hacked, it allows the attacker to obviously DOS or disable the router in the network. You know, that's, that's the obvious one, the one that, you know, annoys everybody, causes downtime. But all these others, you know, are the ones that cause more damage. It's when somebody's hacked your router and you don't know that you've been hacked that the problem starts occurring. Um, routers inherently trust each other. And so once you get into one router, you know, basically start using their routing protocols, their encryption keys and things of that nature, you can actually get from router to router to router to their entire network, map it out, find trusted networks, things of that nature. You can reroute traffic around firewalls and IDS systems. Let's see. You know, monitor and record all ingoing and outgoing traffic. And finally, you know, redirect whatever traffic you want. So, you know, if someone's going to, you know, Bank of America and someone hacks their, you know, router in front of their web server, they can redirect all that to Jimmy Jimmy Joe Bob's, you know, loan officer. Cisco routers have two primary storage mechanisms. We're not going to talk about the ROM. But they have Flash, which acts as a hard drive. It stores persistent data, and it usually holds the startup configuration of the iOS files. That's pretty much primarily what it contains. All the interesting information is in the RAM that holds non-persistent data. Um, the current running configuration, dynamic tables, ARP tables, routing tables, NAT, network address translation, um, any ACL violations, protocol statistics, on and on and on and on. All that's in RAM. In traditional forensics, you go in to a system, and unless it's a multi-terabyte server, you know, if it's a PC, you know, standard procedure is usually to pull the plug, take out the hard drive, make a forensics duplicate of it, and then you analyze the duplicate, and um, you never really bother with live system data. I know that some people do, but the, you know, basic standard procedure and what is currently taught to law enforcement, and that buzz is really annoying. What is taught to law enforcement is pretty much yank the power cord or get a system administrator to shut it down as quickly as possible and image the drive and analyze that image itself. Can we get somebody to look at that, please? Before my ears start bleeding? Maybe I can It's too close to, ah, there we go. I'll just stand back here and, sh you know. But um, the problem with routers is the persistent information on the flash is usually almost useless. You get the startup configuration and you get the iOS image. And in investigation, that's usually not very useful at all. It's live system data that you have to look at for routers. So you need a different process for doing forensics analysis of a router than you do for you know, standard practices. Um, an immediate shutdown destroys all the data. The persistent flash data will likely be unchanged by the hacker and is normally useless. And um, therefore, investigators need to know how to recover the live data so they can analyze that. How many of you have either are network admins or have spent part of your life as a network admin? OK, good. A little over half the room. What's the first thing you do when a router is giving you trouble? Reboot it. Well, guess what that does to all of that volatile information? Gone. So the first thing that admins do is go and remove 
any, you know, most of the evidence that they need to investigate an incident. So ideally, before you go and reboot that router, or you call the janitor and have them go in and you know, reboot it for you, is you, know, you need to figure out whether it's an incident or an accident. Um, a lot of technical people who get into forensics get really bogged down and they love finding minute, you know, bits and bytes on the, you know, hard drive, love being able to write programs that'll parse instant messaging, logs, you know, break the encryption, things of that nature, which is all useful. But the goal isn't to go and find neat computer data and to write neat programs. The goal is to catch the criminal behind the keyboard. And that's a lot harder than just going and finding you know, a piece of technical information, an email or a web server log, or even pictures um, of bad things on a hard drive. Computer evidence is never going to be the smoking gun all by itself. If all you have is one piece of computer evidence, you don't have a whole heck of a lot. What computer evidence does do is it provides leads to other evidence and it corroborates other evidence. Did y'all hear about the case where a hacker hacked into the judge's computer, found child pornography, and then notified law enforcement? In one of my computer investigation classes, we kind of analyze that. And we go through it and, you know, unless that judge has a very bad defense attorney, I don't see him going to jail for that, even if he had that information on there. Could the time steps have been changed by the hacker to make it look like the judge downloaded it two months ago? Fairly easily, you know. See, there's all that information. What about, what if it was on some of the judge's removable media? What if it was on some of his sloppies? Could the hacker have written a program to watch and see if any of the floppies are put in and then copy pictures to it without the judge knowing about it? So again, you have pretty much Anything on that computer, since it was hacked into, is contaminated and useless. And, you know, even the removable media could be. Pretty much the only thing that's really going to get that judge is if he has printouts in a file folder somewhere in his desk. That's about the only thing the hacker couldn't do. But all the digital evidence itself is going to be very difficult to, you know, pin it on him directly. Now, the one thing the hacker probably couldn't do, or didn't do, was modify the judge's ISP logs. And so they might be able to go in, look at the judge's ISP logs, and determine that for three months before the hacker broke in, you know, he was browsing, you know, kitty porn or something like that. Again, the problem happens is being able to change dates and timestamps, hacker could put a program on there that noticed whenever the judge was browsing the web and went to these sites unbeknownst to the judge. So you got lots and lots of problems with digital evidence which makes it a lot of fun. Um, Plunking down, going through the system, and you know, they'll leave it in their office, under their desk, out in the computer lab. But basically it's gotta be detailed, methodical, and unquestionable, which means you can't just stick it in your bottom desk drawer, you know, in a shared office. You're gonna have to have it locked up someplace. Information you record, where you received the evidence, um, when you received it, who you received it from, how you seized it, um, you know, and see, you know, why you seize the evidence and how, ma how you maintain your chain of custody. That how you seize it is going to involve how you shut it down. If you got in there and played around for a half hour before you shut it down, you're going to have problems. Just a sample chain of custody form that we use. This is the top portion of it, and it talks about, you know, case number, date, time, location, evidence. This should be familiar to a lot of you. For those of you that haven't done a lot of this, this is going to be on your conference CD, so you can take this, modify it, use it however you want. I just want to put it up there for those that aren't familiar with chain of custodies. The bottom half, basically when you first get the computer, you know, who you got it from, who you received it, the purpose, and lo purpose that you got it, and where you stored it. That where you stored it is very important. You know, even in a locked normal file cabinet, you know, how many of you have taken paper clips and undone file cabinets? Um, you know, probably quite a lot of you. you know, you're going to need something more secure than a desk drawer or a file cabinet or something like that. And every time it changes hands, you fill this form out. Finally, if you return it or destroy it, you deal with that at the bottom. So, you think your router's been hacked, somebody's in there redirecting your traffic to your competitor's site. Or all of a sudden you find all your customer bids that you're, you know, emailing to your, you know, customers are getting undercut by your competitors. And that's actually the case that happens pretty frequently, if you believe it or not. 
Um, don't go and reboot the router. You know, first instinct is an admin. It's going to be rebooted, see if it fixes anything. Don't do it because you're going to lose all your volatile information. That, the goal is to change nothing and record everything. You want to get in there and find out as much information as you can and change nothing or as little as possible. Um, before you say it's an accident, make sure it's an incident. And before you say it's an incident, make sure it's an accident. Um, quick story about an admin that I used to work with. A, a lot of administrators' goal is to catch a hacker. That is like the holy grail. They just want to say to their friends and dazzle them with war stories to say, I caught some guy in Russia. Um, one of the Cisco routers, routing tables was modified and it was routing around their firewall system. Don't ask me why they had a separate link that was not firewalled to the internet, but um, that was management decisions. But it was actually the writing table was modified to route around it. He immediately assumed, malicious the hacker came in and they were being attacked, went and told management, we've been hacked, but I'm on it. Management was really impressed, you know, asked for periodic updates. Half hour later, actually, sorry, about four hours later, it was a junior admin who'd made a coding error when he was updating some of the tables from their own company. And so then, after four hours of updates on how close you were to catching this hacker, you had to go to management and tell them, oh, it was Fred over there, it, you know, was an hacker. It gets pretty embarrassing. So don't jump to conclusions, no matter how bad you want to catch a hacker um, or a cracker. So do's and don'ts, summary. Access the router through the console. If you can help it, console first, the auxiliary port second, through a modem, and then through the network, modem or terminal server. Console basically is going to provide you the best access. Um, accessing it through the network, the obvious thing, if your hacker's on there, redirecting traffic or watching traffic, and you access it through the network, they're all of a sudden going to know that you're looking at them. And they might do nasty things like shut down your network or, you know, disappear, things like that. And so you really, if you can avoid it, don't use the network to access it because if somebody's watching it, you're just setting off red flags and letting them know to cover themselves. Record your entire session. Whatever terminal server you use to access, you know, whatever software, terminal server, whatever you use to access the console, before you even log in, before you type your name with the login prompt, start recording your session. Log it. All right? And then run show commands. When you're looking at it, just do show commands. Don't do config T. Don't go in there and, you know, and start running anything that's going to modify anything on the router. Um, record the actual time and the router's time. I use this. This is wonderful. This is a $25 clock from Oregon Scientific. Syncs it up to the US Atomic Clock. It's within three seconds of the exact time. So I use this when I have to correlate log files between router 1, router 2, router 3, and so they're not using NTP because very few people actually take the time to bother to set up, you know, a good NTP system. You know, I can go and correlate it all to a central exact time. And so again, that's Oregon Scientific, $25 clock. It's great for, you know, dealing with time issues. Um, so you record what the actual time this says, and you record what time the router says so that you, you know, you know how close it is to the actual time. And then you record all the volatile information. Don't reboot the router. I think that's the third time. That's the last time I'll say it. There. Okay. Don't access it through the network if you can at all help it. Don't run configuration commands. And don't think you're going to get useful information off that flash card. That persistent data, if the hacker is really any good, they're not going to, they're going to see how long the router uptime is. If it's one of those routers that runs and runs and runs, they're just going to update the running configuration. They're just going to update RAM. They're never going to save it to flash. So once you reboot, you've lost everything they've done, where they redirected traffic to, all that information. Again, session recording, you know, if you're using hyperterminal standard Windows system, transfer, capture text. Always start your session recording before you log on. And then show clock detail. The show clock details command is always the first and the last command I run when I'm recording my session. It shows the router's current time, whether it's synced up to an NTP server or not, and whether it's using, you know, daylight savings time, what time zone it's in, all that information. Now here we get a little bit more to the meat of this. You've logged in, you're going and you're recording your session. Yes? Mm hmm Go away. But if you ask the console, they can also be seen by doing a show session. So what's the 
Well, they have to be ac actually accessing the router at the same time you do if you're accessing to the console for them to see it. Okay? If you access it through the network, if they're redirecting traffic or they're monitoring your traffic, they don't even have to be logged into the router. They just have to have some kind of program watching the network traffic itself. You know, it's actually ideal if you, the hacker's logged into the router at the same time you are, because when you do that show users command on the next page, it's going to show you where they're logged in from, what IP address they're coming from, and information like that. And so, accessing through the console means they have to be logged into the router itself at the same time you are to detect that you're looking at what's going on. Whereas over the network, they don't even have to be in the router. They can, you know, notice that you're an administrator, somebody from that company is accessing the router. Does that make sense? First thing, show clock detail. Um, just to get a current time, show version. That shows you the iOS version, shows you the uptime, shows you the, you know, how much memory it has, all sorts of useful information. Then you do show the running configuration. That's what's in RAM and that's what's active on the router right now. Then you do show startup configuration. That's what's on flash. That's going to be on the flash card and that's what's going to be loaded once the router is rebooted. Getting those two, go take those over to a Unix box, run a diff command on them. You can real quickly see if they're different. If you're a you know, good network administrator, you should also have your configuration files backed up to another system. Even if the hacker changed both, was it, even if it changed both your running config and your startup config, you can run the diff against your you know, stored backup configuration to see if any changes have been made. Yes? Show support command that gives you everything. Just didn't think of it at the time. So what? Show tech support. Show, show tech support does all this stuff. All this stuff? Most of this stuff, not all. Cool. Well, I have to play with that. I've not used that. I just have a Perl script that runs all this for me. So. Show tech support. Five hundred pages of information. Tells you everything more than you need to know. These have just. These have always shown me what I need to know. You know, without a lot of extra information. So. I'm sorry, yes. Actually, show tech support. Um, they're saying we'll show you most of this information and a lot more. And so, you know, what you might do is put that at the beginning or end of your program, get all the information, and then if you want it, you know, specific information that you don't have to go through such a volume as information, you could run these individually. So, I have to, I have to play with that. I just wrote a, wrote a quick Perl script to do all these and actually didn't even think about the show tech support. So I have to look at that. That's a really good suggestion from about three of you at once, so. <laughs> um, show reload shows you if the router is scheduled to automatically reboot, reboot itself later. Most of the time they're not, occasionally they are, and so you just want to take a look at that to make sure that, you know, five minutes into your analysis they're not going to automatically reboot itself and lose the information that you need. Um, show IP route, show the routing table, show IP ARP, um, show the ARP table. Standard things. Um, show users. Any you know you, people logged on. Um, show logging. Logging information. That's going to be one of your most important ones, especially if they're logging to a syslog server or something like that, because then you're going to want to get the information off the syslog server. Um, a lot of routers are set up with a circular buffer, you know, 600 what kilobytes, something like that. And so when you do show logging, it'll also show you the internal router's buffer and how that's set up. Um, show IP interface. The routers I've worked on have only been running IP, so that's kind of where show IP interface comes from on this. You probably want to add a show interface to this, which then you know, tech support would give you all that also. But you probably should add show, just show interface under that right there. Um, so you can get that information, especially if you're you know, running protocols, not just IP. Show TCP brief all. That'll show you your, you know, basically TCP connections to and from the router, anything that's in listen mode. Um, you probably need to add the all to your notes. I think I added that afterwards. Show your, show your sockets, show your network address translations in verbose mode. So then you can, you know, if they're coming in through your network, you'll be able to track them back through that. Show your IP cache. So your Cisco Express forwarding, CEF, 
CEF can be set up on routers to do layer three forwarding and it'll auto configure and it has some nice things like, you know, what Unicast or U URPF and, um, you know, to automatically disallow spoofing. But I always, I've never actually used the show IP CEF in investigation. The routing tables have always given me what I needed, but also I put it in there so I'll make sure I get it just in case layer three information is changed dynamically so I can see what's actually going on. Um, show SNMP user, those will show you SNMP version 3 users and groups. And then show clock detail, again, at the end to get another updated timestamp. When I've been you know, analyzing routers, these have been the commands that have been the most effective in getting information out. And um, I've not played with the show tech support, so I'm going to have to mess with that. And if any of y'all you know, find that it does a better job, you know, of this, shoot me an email and I'll update the presentation. And then also, after I've gotten on it, I do a remote scan, um, use NMAP, do, you know, TCP SYN scan, UDP scan, and uh, RPC scan. Um, and I do ports one through all 65,000. Yeah. Sorry, just uh, on the other slide, uh, show the in case uh, someone's running uh, active dumping on the road. Show depot. Add that to your slides too. Show debug. He said might provide you useful information in case they're, you know, going and packet dumping, you know, from the router. Um, hmm. It's specifically it's not packet dumping specifically what's happening with the protocol and the link setup. That's what we I'm just thinking. Well, for instance, they might set up show. They might set up debug show. If somebody's going to log in, so as soon as you log in on the console, they see it instantaneously and they just bounce it out. They have to be logged in remotely, so you'd be able to check that through looking at the network traffic um, to see the connections coming from. So that that'd be interesting. And then they'd have to be dumping it to their terminal session. But. Um, so yeah, it might be good to check, you know, check what the debug level is at and see if they're saying it's the terminals. Yeah? Yes, it's a penalty for debug if you slow down your router depending on what all you're enabling by 30 to 70 percent, it might spring down the whole thing to a crawl. Yeah, and you're right. With, uh, with this, um, you know, if somebody's good enough to go in and actually set it up so they, you know, are s redirecting your traffic and then, you know, sitting and watching that, they could set something up, you know, to go in and try to bounce the router as soon as it saw you logged in. Even an automated tool to watch and do that. But, um, trying to think. And the only way there would be to pull your network cable. But then again, you lose some of your dynamic information if you pull your network cable. So it's, you know, so. Show tech support, Will? So if you use it instead of like show you better the rules of the platform and if you press Interesting, anybody else had that experience that show tech support will strip out your passwords and your SNMP community strings? I'm not sure about that. I have noticed that. All right. Show tech support will remove passwords. It will, will, will? All right. So the show tech support will remove passwords and possibly SNMP community strings. I'm not sure what passwords exactly it removes. We'll have to go and play with that. And so, if, you know, I'll take a look at that and anybody, you know. It doesn't remove the passwords. It doesn't show them on the output. It doesn't actually. So it doesn't actually, okay. So just on the, it removes them from the output, but it doesn't remove them from the router itself. All right. So yeah, I've never, okay. So if you want to get, you know, hopefully the person is using, you know, enable secret to, you know, encrypt their passwords, but even you have a lot of things, you know, community strings and things of that nature that aren't encrypted on the router when you do that. And show tech support may not show you all the information you need because um, it'll strip out, strip out passwords and community strings. Back to this slide. Do a port scan just to see what ports are open. This is especially important 
if they've changed the password and you can't get in the router, this may be all you're able to get. And that's when you end up putting, you know, sniffer to capture network traffic on it and watch where it's coming from. Hopefully you'll catch that person logging back in. Um, hopefully using Telnet, so then you can get the password back, but more than likely if they're doing this, they're going to be using SSH anyway. And then I try to do an SNMP scan. SNMP, if they've got that running, or they haven't modified that, they just modified your password, you can get a lot of information through that. You can get, you know, your, your IP tables, your, you know, ARP tables, your routing, all that information from SNMP. So if you can't get in the router to do show commands, you know, doing SNMP walk on your MIB tables can get you lots of valuable information. Um, so, yeah. Are those in that They should be on the CD slide, and um, if not, you can get my email address later, and I'll email them to you. And I had, on the last slide, actually, in there is my email address. So, and if they should be on there, because uh, I sent I sent them the updated version with those on it. So I hope they burnt. I hope that's the one they burnt to the CD. When I'm analyzing a router for an intrusion, they're usually going to come in either through you know, a vulnerability like the HTT build vulnerability, or they're going to guess your passwords, or they're going to watch you telnetting into your router and, and keep, capture your passwords that way. Um, so I always go and check, see what iOS version the system is running, go look up on Cisco real fast, bug track, see if there are any current vulnerabilities to, to see if that's the obvious way they got in. Um, you compare your running and your startup configurations. You look through all of your log files. And I just don't mean the logging on the router. Hopefully your router is set up to do syslog or possibly AAA logging, logging all the commands that are run, which is really nice. And then you look at, you know, obviously look at your timestamps, you know, get ISP logs, compare the, you know, router logs, logins to the ISP logs to see who came in at certain times from what IPs, standard, you know, standard investigation issues. There are six or seven logging types Cisco does. Console logging. Basically, everything that's turned on, all the logging is going to be going, going to the console, and if you're logged in through the console, you'll capture it in your session when you're recording it. Buffer logging, Cisco has a circular buffer in memory, and so basically, it will keep the last however many log messages, depending on the size of the buffer. And do it, when you do a show logging, it will spit that entire buffer out, so again, your session will record that. Terminal logging. Um, if you do, if you know you had someone logged in and they were doing the, you know, the debug command to actually watch and see if somebody logged into the console, they'd be turn on, they'd be logging that information probably to a terminal and having some process watch that. And so, if you're logged in through the network and you want to see the logging information, you know, to your session, you're going to have to turn on terminal logging. And then finally, syslog logging, um, often that's most useful. It'll send all the logging information to a syslog server, so then you can record it on a separate system. And so if, they, if a hacker comes in and clears the logging information from the router, you still got it on a server. SNMP logging, you can log in SNMP traps to servers. AAA logging, that is great. You can actually set it up to log every command that's run on a system. You can log when the command starts and when the command stops on the system to, an a, to a network access server. And so that's really useful. And of course, ACL violation logging, um, standard things you put to log or the log dash input at the end of an ACL so you can go and, and log every time something like that happens. ACL is either, it basically is matched. Um, so you're going in and you find that somebody's using your router to do nasty stuff, like hack into other people and make it look like it's coming from you. If you know, if you can, it's great not to mess with the router and go go on site, put a you know Linux box or a sniffer or something like that in between, you know, the router and the network, so you can log out information without making changes to the router that somebody might detect. But if the router's in Canada and the only person up there is a janitor who only knows how to do is flip the on/off switch, you know, the router may be all you have to start basically trying to capture information about the attacker um, in real time. And so you can turn on logging with those commands right there. Um, look at the second command, you talk about, you turn on timestamps, include the date time, local time, and also show you the time zone. It's important to have show time zone because that can really mess you up when you get routers from different time zones and they don't have the time zone in the log file. 
Um, I usually do no login console just because I get, you know, don't like it messing up all the information that I'm getting and typing in. Um, turn logging on. The logging buffer turns on the circular buffer. Informational level, you, you know, you might want to start informational. You can, might, if you want, if you want to get lots of information, turn on debug. The problem is it buffers out of your circular buffer, buffer faster. What syslog facility? Local six. And then finally, you know, what syslog server to send the information to? And so what I do is, you know, if logging wasn't turned on and I was using a router to analyze something, I'd go in, you know, start turn on logging and start sending it to a syslog server from that point on. AAA. New. Nope. Config terminal, AAA accounting. You have four systems here. You have exec accounting, system accounting, connection accounting, and network accounting. And um, these are kind of recommended starting points for that. Um, the exec accounting will go through, and every time a command is run, it will record what command was run and when it was run to your AA you know, authentication server. And so if you have that turned on, if you have AAA, turn on accounting so you can actually get lots of detailed information about what somebody's doing on your router and when they did it. And so those are some, if you're using default groups, the, you know, TACX Plus, you can do that there. Radius will allow you to do limited command accounting, but it's not going to be as robust as TACX Plus. It gives as much detailed information. ACLs. The first ACL there, access limits 149, permit, TCP host, blah, 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 and then log input. It's set up. It doesn't do anything except record the number of packets coming in from that IP address you know, to port 161. And so you can use permit statements by putting log, so you can, you know, log the number of times packet, packets come in and out, watch them specifically, have that information sent to a syslog server, you know, with a log checker on there, and have it actually, you know, page you or something like that when somebody comes in from that address. ACLs, of course, the denies, you add the log input to the end of the ACLs there, and you can get information on the, you know, denies and things like that. And so, Again, using the router itself to gather information. All right, we talked about you know, a little bit about hacking routers, usually done through misconfigurations or you know Cisco vulnerabilities, buffer overflows, um, router hardware and software. How with Cisco router forensics, it's all the real the volatile information. Rarely are you going to have a hacker leave you information you know, sitting there on the flash waiting for you to help track them down. Talk about chain of custody, um, brief instant response where you don't go and first thing you do is reboot the router. Um, how to gather volatile info internally and externally. And, um, and since the um, show tech support command strips the passwords just from the output, I probably would go add the show tech support command and then run the checklist of commands so you, you know, you'll be able to find the information quickly when you need it, but you also have the detailed information that show tech support gives you. And um, let's see, we talked about using the router itself. If you don't have access and you have to use the router itself to, you know, watch the network and gather information about the attacker, you have seven different logging types that you can turn on. The most useful are going to be syslog and AAA accounting on those. And that's pretty much it, unless anybody has any questions um, about the process or actually any, any other commands they'd recommend adding to the list. On your CD is going to be, you'll have a copy of this presentation. You have uh, the router forensics checklist, which actually provides those list of commands and then tells you a little bit about what they pick up. Um, you'll have a sample chain of custody form and you'll have some example, you know, evidence tags that you can print out to stickers and, you know, do something like that. So, other than that, that's it. Thank you.